Welcome to Coffee and Questions. Thanks for joining us today. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. Uh, grab a coffee, grab a chai, take a break, sit down, relax, join us in this conversation that we are having. Uh, we just finished up a series on, on um, pain and suffering and evil and, and how we know that God exists even those, those even though those things are real. And, um, and so we just finished that up. Here at Coffee and Questions, we like to take your questions about God and Christianity and the Bible We'll just try to give you a little bit of an answer. Try to try to get it started and going in the right direction. We don't make long videos, so we, we are dependent upon your questions. If you've got questions about any of the videos I previously did or anything else, just let me know. Put them in the comments. Um, email them to me however you can. I'd love to dig deeper into any topic as you ask questions about it. Just out of curiosity, have you ever heard of Charles Foster? I put a link in the description down below um, at, that uh, uh, just connecting you to an article about him. It's just one that uh, you can read. And apparently Charles Foster spent large chunks of time uh, pretending to be animals. In fact, he talked about, he, he wrote a book about this. And I guess he spent at least six weeks of time, uh, cumulative, added together, um, pretending to be a badger living in a, a hole in the ground with, you know, something tied over his eyes so he couldn't see very well, eating worms, all right, and, and uh, crazy, right? I mean, here's this professor at Oxford, and he's out there pretending to be badgers and otters and foxes. What would that be like, a human condescending to live in a hole, to, to sleep on the ground? Yet some have suggested that Jesus did more than that when he visited us. In fact, I would agree with that. He condescended from the very form and likeness of God. He didn't give up being God, but the form and likeness of God, that of a human. He left heaven to live on earth, and he did that to save us. At least, that is what many evangelicals will tell you. In fact, I would agree with that. He did come to save us. But the question has been asked, how were people saved before Jesus? Before he condescended to earth, before he forged a new way, a new relationship with us for God, a new path to God, created this new covenant uh, that the New Testament is all about, how was man saved? Well, that's a good question. And let's dive in. And as always, if you find anything confusing, you know, or you won't think I'm wrong, leave a comment, uh, send me an email, just put something down below. This is about a conversation. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on these things as well. So let's keep this conversation going. Just let me know what you're thinking. Um, so the question is, how does man, how, how did mankind get saved before Jesus? Now, if you come here on Sunday morning at all, you'll, you've probably seen me define something in one of my sermons, something that, that a lot of people will commonly just think of, like, that's, I, we already know the answer to. I like to find a definition to make sure that we are all working on the same page, that we are all um, communicating at the same level. And that's true with salvation. Why? Well, because there are some people out there who would take the biblical languages and the, the biblical terminology that we use, and they use them in different sense. And so they would talk about salvation as in saving people from social justice issues, such as poverty or prejudice or, or, or racism. Now, those are good things for us as Christians to be involved in, you know, uh, but the biblical concept of salvation is, is not one of saving people out of their poverty or out of social justice issues. And in order to understand this question, how were people saved, we have to understand what salvation is so we know what that looks like and know that that's how it was accomplished. So as you consider salvation in a biblical sense, you really have to focus in on the New Testament. You see, in the Old Testament, there's, there's a lot of talk about salvation, but it's often focused around saving me from my enemies. You know, David, saving me from my enemies. I'm getting chased around. Saul wants to kill me. All right. And, and um, all those sorts of things. But in the New Testament, the focus is mostly on the soul. Uh, consider the first sermon that Peter gives, right? Uh, Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit had just come and filled all the apostles, and they run out and they start preaching, and, and they start conveying the core concepts, the core message uh, of Christianity to the Jews that are in Jerusalem at that time. 
And as he finishes up this sermon, people are all upset. Ah, how do I get saved? And, and he talks to them about repenting and, and seeking forgiveness and being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and receiving the Holy Spirit. And then he finishes up um, in Acts 2, verse 40, and, and, he, and it says he continued to convince them. With, and with many words, he, it says he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourself from this crooked generation. Later, Peter's talking to the Sanhedrin in chapter 4, verse 12, and he says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men, given among men, by which we must be saved. What was Jesus supposed to save people from anyway? And, and what is this salvation accomplishing? Well, first, salvation is is. The salvation that we are receiving is from two things, sin and judgment. Think about it like this. Consider your basic toddler. When he toddles out into the street, into a road, he needs to be saved by someone greater than him. He needs, he needs someone to come in and save him out of that situation. And, and he needs more than just the saving from that particular situation, from the, the truck that may come and hit and kill him. He needs to be he needs to be saved from his own actions. You can't just take the toddler out of the road, set him on the sidewalk, walk away, and he'll be fine. There's a good chance he's gonna to toddle right back out onto that road and get himself hurt again. So the salvation needs to be for more than just um, the road. It needs to be the road and his own actions. Uh, likewise, sin and judgment, right? The sin is the actions that we are taking that are putting us in the place of judgment uh, with God. And consider um, a child who's slightly older and who tries to walk out of a store with candy that she hasn't paid for. And she's trying to, to walk out of this store and, and, and again, she, she's walking out of the store and the, the danger isn't as imminent. It's not this truck that's barreling down on her. Yet she's going to put herself into a situation where she is under judgment. She is, thievery is still thievery and she needs to be saved from her own actions. All right. Now let's consider this. Let's take this out of the physical realm and take it into the spiritual. You see, men and women have consistently, consistently broken the rules of the holy God. The one who created this world. And as mentioned, he is holy, and that means he cannot stand, he cannot have in the presence in his presence any imperfection. For our sin, we started, um, for, for our sin, we stand under the penalty of separation from God. Um, this is a, a pattern that was created by our, our founding ancestors, Adam and Eve. You know, they first transgressed way back in the Garden of Eden. And they corrupted, God, they corrupted God's creation. Uh, they transgressed God's laws. And, and, and they corrupted humanity ourselves. All right? And because of that, we died spiritually. Uh, they, they, they pass that on to us. There's, there's death on to us. Romans 5 teaches us that death and sin were the result of Adam and Eve's decision. And that's been passed on to humanity. And thus, humanity stood and currently stands in need uh, of salvation. Salvation from our judgment that's coming down from our sins and our, our rebellion against God. And, and salvation from our sins that bring that judgment. But if we are guilty, why should anyone want to save us? Wouldn't it be better just to simply let us pay the penalty for our sins? Well, ultimately, because the choice to trespass against God is more than just a bad decision. It is a rejection of his rule, a rejection of God's rule. It's a, it's a rebellion. So ultimately, the answer for that is, is being cast from the presence of God. Ultimately, the punishment for that is being cast from the very presence of God. And that, of course, is the answer to what salvation is accomplishing. We're being saved from our sin and our judgment, but it's accomplishing is this ability, this opportunity to be in a right relationship with God. Ultimately, God being love and light and good and all that desires to have a relationship. He desires to have a relationship with us again. He doesn't want us to be cast out of his presence. He doesn't want us to be lost from him for all eternity. So yes, salvation saves us from the road like the toddler. 
And its goal is not just to save us from the truck of the judgment coming, but its goal is to bring us back into a right relationship with God. Well, thank you for joining me today. And and I don't have any extra resources for you today besides that article about Charles Foster. Um, uh, but I, I do suggest the Bible. I mean, a lot of, a lot of what I'm coming from is straight out of the Bible. Romans 5, Romans 2, Acts 2, I mean. Um, I mean, just read the book of Romans, and it talks a lot about salvation. Thanks for joining me today, and I want to make sure that you understand, guys, that you are loved.